I'm going to try not to make this too technical, <clears throat> but I do have a few slides that talk about physiology, so I want you to bear with me and I'll try to make them as, as easy as possible. I'm going to start off talking about medical abortion because that's a, a place where, as Charmaine was talking about, a place where the strategy around abortion has changed. There we go. So I'm going to try to answer six questions. What is a medical abortion? How does it work? How often is it used? What are the risks? What restrictions apply or might apply? And where are things going from here? <clears throat> medical abortion is the use of a chemical or a chemical regimen to kill the implanted embryo or fetus and cause the expulsion of the unborn child in placenta. When we talk about medical abortion, medical abortion can actually take place through all trimesters uh, according to medical definitions. But I'm going to focus mostly on what's used in the first trimester. And the most common regimens used in the first trimester are mifepristone, which is RU486, and mesoprostol, which is Cytotec, or a combination of methotrexate, which is a chemotherapy agent, and mesoprostol. But there are other medical abortion regimens used, and there are other medical abortion regimens in development. This is a page from the latest WHO recommendations over the summer, um, this past year, 2012, and uh, they're kind of shocking. Um, what they're recommending is that mifepristone and mesoprostol be used as a first-line abortion agent around the world, uh, regardless of gestational age. So for pregnancies up to nine weeks or 63 days, uh, mifepristone and mesoprostol, that is the, the first section up here. Um, <coughs> For pregnancies of gestational age after that, they're talking about mifepristone and mesoprostol, but they require that to be administered in a healthcare facility because when you administer mifepristone and mesoprostol in the second trimester, you have a huge incidence of major hemorrhage. So unlike the first trimester where they're sort of saying you can give this and send the woman home and see her back in a month, um, second trimester is recognized as a very dangerous time to have a mesoprostol and mifepristone abortion. And then for gestational age over 12 weeks, and we're talking all the way up through, um, they recommend uh, repeated doses of vaginal mesoprostol after a pre-medication with mifepristone. All right, why do I talk about that? I want you to understand the scope of where medical abortion is going worldwide. And I also want you to understand a little bit with this slide about how it works. So bear with me, <laughs> and we'll, we'll talk through this slide. What we have is two menstrual cycles. This is a menstrual cycle without a pregnancy, and this is a menstrual cycle with a pregnancy. Okay? So what you see is that in the ovary, there's a place where an egg is forming, and then the egg is released. That's ovulation. That is a, a very brief period of time. That's, that's a moment. And that egg has to be fertilized within 24 hours, or it disappears. So believe it or not, there's only 24 hours out of the month when you can actually get pregnant. Um, but since sperm live for a longer period of time, about five days at the outset, the range of uh, when intercourse can happen and result in pregnancy is much wider. So five days before ovulation, and then it has to happen within about within 24, 48 hours after ovulation. Okay. If... if um, once the egg is released, then the ovary forms this funny-looking thing called a corpus luteum, which literally translated means yellow body, because it makes a lot of hormones. And the hormone that it makes is this hormone here called progesterone. So the progesterone level goes up, no implantation, progesterone level goes down, estrogen level goes down, and you have a shedding of the lining called a period. Okay. Well, what happens with a pregnancy? You've got formation of an egg in an egg sac that's called a follicle. You've got release of the egg and then fertilization. And then there's, there's talk between um, this fertilized uh, embryo uh, because once an egg is fertilized, there's no egg left. It's an embryo, a one-celled embryo, a two-celled embryo, a four-celled embryo. It's, there's no fertilized egg implanting. Fertilized eggs don't implant. Fertilized eggs are embryos and embryos implant. So seven days after fertilization, the embryo implants. 
right here. This is the lining of the uterus, the embryo implants, and then sends signals back to the ovary to make more and more progesterone. So what you see is the progesterone level goes up, like here, and then it goes way up because progesterone means for gestation hormone. That's what progesterone means, okay? All right. So what you have when you look at the structure of progesterone, whoa, baby, what happened? Here go. <laughs> when you look at the structure of progesterone up here, you're going to notice a little circle and a box, okay? This is normal progesterone, what's in your body. Now, let's look at mifepristone. You see the same sort of structure, but in the box, there's a different group, and in the circle, there's a different group. This change in the structure allows mifepristone to act like the wrong key in a lock. Now, if you've ever had a, a uh, I, I had a, a Honda once that uh, had my, my husband had a little different kind of a car. And I had a copy of his key, so I went out once to put it in the Honda, and I, I put it in, and it broke. Didn't turn the car on, couldn't get the key out. It was a, it was a mess. Anyway, it's the same sort of thing happening. What happens is the, the mifepristone goes to the same place the progesterone is supposed to go, and progesterone is supposed to turn a key in a lock to cause the cells to change. The mifepristone blocks it. Okay, well, how, how often is medical abortion, RU46, used? If you go to the CDC, for 2009, there were uh, 784,000 abortions uh, reported from 45 states. There's many states that don't report. 16% um, of these were medical abortion at less than eight weeks, and that was one-fourth of all abortions performed at less than eight weeks. And that's 2009. We're four years out from that. Uh, remember, it was only approved in 2000. And 2000. So um, the, the use of uh, medical abortion has uh, increased dramatically. Um, what I want to bring your attention to is this terrible slide that's busy. But if you look over here, this is surgical abortion, curatage. Okay, and here are the numbers. Less than eight weeks, or less than 13 weeks, greater than 13 weeks. Here's medical abortion, less than eight weeks. But look at this. We have a, a, almost 1% a per, of abortions which are medical abortions that greater than eight weeks gestation. Okay. What are the risks of an abortion? What are, uh, the risks of a medical abortion are the risks of other safe abortions. And that is short-term risks of, like hemorrhage, infection, surgical complications, incomplete abortion, ongoing pregnancy, and ultimately death. The, risk, the long term risks, the long term risks of safe abortion include preterm birth, psych, adverse psychological outcome, which um, Dr. Coleman's going to go in great detail, so I'm going to skip all these long term complications, and premenopausal breast cancer. And, and uh, Dr. Shiro is also going to talk about the long term complications. So I'm going to focus mostly on the short term complications. There was an excellent article that came out of Finland. Um, looking at 42,000 women, and in Finland, this is all registry-based. They own your medical record. What, what they concluded was startling. The overall incidence of adverse events was fourfold higher in medical abortions compared with surgical abortions. Almost a fifth of patients who had a medical abortion had a complication. In surgical abortions, it was about one out of 20. The risk of hemorrhage, medical abortion, 15% versus 2% for surgical. Risk of incomplete abortion, 6.7% versus 1.6% for surgical. Risk of emergency surgery, 5.9% as, as opposed to 1.8% for surgical. Why is that important? Well, when you put your 20 bucks a pop in for your Ella and you take three of those trying to abort your pregnancy, who's going to manage your risk? Who's going to manage your complications? It's got horrendous implications for the future. It also has implications for telemed abortions. So we, uh, this woman <clears throat> is, uh, faces a computer screen and says, oh yes, I know I'm less than seven weeks pregnant. Nobody's examining her. Nobody does an ultrasound maybe. You know, and she, uh, the doctor on the other end says, it sounds like I believe you, pushes a button and she gets her medicine. Who's going to manage these complications? 
Um, so what are our restrictions on medical abortion? Well, the FDA had actually intended to put restrictions on, and that's why the FDA used subpart H. Subpart H was designed to try to uh, allow the FDA to have some post-marketing restrictions, but all of those post-marketing restrictions were skipped. They've all been flaunted. So the FDA is impotent. The FDA has RU486 under the Risk uh, Evaluation and Management System, listed since 2008, but nothing's been done. AUL has been instrumental in uh, state regulations, trying to uh, allow the state, which has the ability to regulate medicine, uh, allowing the state legislature to decide how RU486 would be used and to restrict that to the FDA protocol. Um, and that's been bitterly fought. And finally, what you have, and for all you lawyers here, I hope you talk to your malpractice buddies, because the final end would be tort uh, malpractice uh, law. There are a few malpractice cases. It's notoriously difficult to sue an abortionist, but it is one hope that there would be some check on this willy-nilly use of what is a very dangerous drug for women. Thank you.